Now, presumably, there is the ultimate experience machine of uh, post-human superintelligence, assuming that is that post-human superintelligence isn't uh, intellectually capable of designing a real-life paradise that there's no need to leave. But, yeah, I mean, just uh, intuitively imagine what would be a Neanderthal or a, a chimpanzee's conception of of paradise or someone living in medieval times, uh, the land of cocaine, uh, each age has its own vision of what the ideal life or the, the ideal society is like. And so, yes, if one does step into one's, the, yeah, the, 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 the proto-experience machine, so to speak, one may be missing out uh, on something far more fabulous. However, another way to look at uh, this is ex extremely uh, 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 indulgent. That our overriding obligation is to phase out uh, suffering and talk of uh, an endless odyssey of, uh, of experience machines is, uh, yes, a, a, a fantasy at least from where we are now. Essentially, with modern technology, it should be possible to make the reality uh, match one's desires. Uh, we talk of experience machines simply because everyday Darwinian life is so miserable. But uh, yes, with uh, biotechnology one can create superhuman beauty far more vivid than anything one can uh, imagine today. Uh, why not go down the direct biological route? If one does go down the biological route, of course one can still immerse oneself uh, in designer paradises in VR. Oh, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Depends. I mean, if you recall how a famished captive rat will cross an electrified grid in order to have the opportunity to stimulate its reward centers. Uh, even a starving rat who hasn't eaten for 10 days normally won't cross an electrified grid. The rat will cross an electrified grid to get the chance to self-stimulate. So if one's anticipated reward were great enough, who knows what one would do. Um, I think uh, responsibility now is to understand the nature of reality, the nature of value, the theoretical upper bounds of rational agency, because only then can we know what we're obliged to do. And though I think ultimately we can all collectively enter experience machines, either experience machines or for that matter, real life designer paradises, it would be troubling if we prematurely plugged in and didn't fulfill all our obligations. As to what our obligations are, if you're a Buddhist or a negative utilitarian or some sort of benetarian, they are much more modest in one sense, simply to do absolutely everything we can to phase out suffering within our Hubble volume. If, on the other hand, you're, let's say, a classical utilitarian, uh, then our responsibility is to make sure we can engineer the richest possible paradises rather than prematurely plug in and get trapped in some suboptimal utopia. Once we have phased out suffering, will we have an obligation to increase well-being. Yes, I mean, <laughs> intuitively, yes, certainly in some sense, if one is a classical utilitarian or uh, uh, has uh, an ethical system in any way resembling cla classical utilitarianism, why settle for the medi mediocre uh, when one can attain the sublime? And decision theoretic rationality, if nothing else, dictates that we engineer ever better uh, societies and civilizations. As to what better means, uh, this obviously is a controversial topic, 
but in some sense I think the pleasure pain axis does disclose the universe's inbuilt metric of value. Why this is the case we, we, we simply don't understand, uh, yet nonetheless yeah, this, this underlies my own core ethic and, and, and value scheme. So if you're a hard-edged negative utilitarian, then once phasing out suffering is complete, then all, ethic, all, all ethical obligations have been discharged, that's it. It's all there is to do. Yes, um, but one's got to remember that many people would be upset, in some cases profoundly upset, at the prospect of not being able to maximise their opportunities to flourish. And any policy option that involves even a twinge of disappointment on your part, then other things being equal, that policy option is not that of negative utilitarianism. And the negative utilitarian is all in favour of us designing fabulous designer paradises for all sentient beings. One shouldn't uh, regard this as any way a bleak doctrine. Policy is an interesting one because if you believe that we're just continuums of micro experiences that, that in themselves uh, uh, appear and disappear within femtoseconds, then it, it seems as though it's ethically abhorrent for one, uh, one microsecond, one millisecond, one femtosecond of pain um, paid for you know a million years of pleasure in the future. Yes, I mean most of us do have this conception of a, a, an enduring metaphysical ego and for us not to wake up in the morning if waking up in the morning involves having a fabulously good time in some sense it's immoral. Um, now there may well be very good instrumental reasons uh, within a negative utilitarian framework to ensure the sanctity of life, but one of the counterintuitive uh, implications of negative utilitarianism is that no one is harmed by not existing. Do you believe that as soon as you value reducing suffering more than you value increasing pleasure, does that automatically make you, whether you know it or not, um, if you take this argument to its conclusions, a negative utilitarian. Um, was Buddha a negative utilitarian? Perhaps not in the strict sense, in that he didn't have a careful calculus, but when Buddha says, I teach one thing and one thing only, suffering and the relief of suffering, uh, he is implicitly signing on to some sort of quasi nu ethic. Um, only, of course, Buddha hasn't generally been uh, taxed for wanting to extinguish life uh, uh, or anything like that. Uh, uh, negative utilitarianism, I think the, the name, though there's some controversy over this, uh, is due to Karl Popper, who s stressed the primacy of relieving suffering over the creation of, of, of pleasure. Um, and Smart's rebuttal of Popper uh, pointing out that a, an explosive device that painlessly destroyed all life and all civilization would have an equal outcome, that is often regarded as the reductio ad absurdum of negative utilitarianism. Um, this is the argument I would use, you know, pose uh, a, a simple thought experiment. Imagine you have two buttons. Uh, one button is you destroy the entire world. The other is a copy button in which you create a type identical copy of the world. Which, which button would you press? Would you press either button? Um, only a small minority of people would erase uh, all sentient life or all civilization. But equally, many people would pause, and in some cases uh, 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 do more than pause before pressing the copy button, knowing that they will be responsible for creating suffering on, imaginable, uh, on an unimaginable scale as well. Um, I think this highlights 
uh, status quo bias. Yes, I mean, a classical utilitarian, if he or she decided that the balance in some sense of pleasure over pain would favourable, would press the copy button, um, in spite of uh, the unimaginable suffering that would be created too. I mean, I mean here's another exper thought experiment, and one poses these thought experiments just to highlight just how radically counterintuitive are some of the implications of all our major ethical theories. Uh, imagine if a genie offers you the possibility, uh, a super exponential growth in my uh, 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 well-being at the, uh, at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the cost of an exponential growth in your suffering. Should one press the button? Now, super exponential growth is unimaginably uh, more powerful uh, than mere exponential growth, uh, but intuitively, at least, the consequences are absolutely obscene. I mean, suffering is a linear growth of suffering is, is, is unimaginably awful, but imagine what exponential growth is like. But here we are, the, uh, the classical utilitarian is apparently committed uh, to this uh, truly frightful consequence. Um, yeah, I haven't been able to get my head around the consequence of like, uh, being a classical utilitarian to accept exponential suffering without, at least without some form of trade-off. I guess for me, I, I'd be opportunistically leaning towards different forms of utilitarianism based on the circumstances that invited the right kind of, the, the, the right form of utilitarianism to take. I, I, in that way, I'd, I'd suggest that maybe some form of adaptive utilitarian is, uh, is what I am. I would favour negative utilitarianism in, in a case where it looks as though there's no hope for, um, on balance, a much greater degree of uh, pleasure than there would be suffering. I'd also be cautious about like um, allowing, you know, huge amounts of new, like uh, elevated increases in suffering. Um, but if, if suffering were to um, be at a static or decreasing level, um, then I'd consider being a classical utilitarian if the payoffs of like hedonism were this, you know, far in advance of like any, any sort of uh, amount you'd have to pay to help my suffering you pay. Mainly because classical utilitarian in that context would then allow people to make the choice whether they wanted to endure further suffering or whether they, if they wanted to commit their their present and future selves to endure suffering for the benefit of um, even further future selves. And who, whose choice is it? Yes. What is the, what is the safe option? Uh, one of the reasons why I think we should go down the recalibration route is that even if, according to some ethical theories it doesn't lead to an optimal outcome it can still lead to uh, an outcome that is extraordinarily good because uh, there are very few ethical value systems that don't give some weight to happiness and well-being uh, and if people are allowed to retain their existing values and preferences as recalibration does, except in so far as those preferences are for the retention of involuntary suffering, uh, then yes, this strikes me as a an acceptable compromise. Right. If we worked out a decision, a universal decision theory, right? Um, a decision theory from the point of view of the universe, mm. would you think that it would look exactly like negative utilitarianism? Now that's a very interesting question. <laughs> okay, it's a, a, a that's easy. too interesting a question. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
part of the problem is that one starts relying on one's, purely on one's everyday intuitions rather than asking, is this the correct answer? And of course, there may, depending on one's meta-ethical theory, be no correct answer. But, yeah, if one does believe in some sense of the objectivity of value or, or disvalue, then in some sense one is, is, is searching for the correct response. Um, That does entail not getting damned within some sort of local maximum, like a um, local maximum logic experience machine. Mm. If if there is possibly more useful information, like over the over some top or mountain, that needs to be sort of uh, explored. Yeah, essentially, what one is trying to discover, so to speak, is God's utility function. <laughs> Uh, if one says that, it can suggest something theological, but means more in the sense that uh, Einstein would sometimes talk about uh, God as a, as a figurative speech. Uh, why go in for any form of either negative or classical utilitarianism in the first place? It, essentially, one reason is that utilitarianism seems to offer the only real scope for naturalizing value and disvalue. It's not as though it's impossible to create other value systems. Of course one can, but they all seem in some way arbitrary or human or human constructions. Whereas in the case of the pleasure pain axis it really does seem to to, to yield this inbuilt metric of value. I think a lot of people uh, ascribe some kind of inherent value to complexity and one of the reasons, or at least complexity and variety, and one reason is that uniformity seems boring, and boredom, though not in the same realm as suffering, is not a, a pleasant state to be in. Now, without the pleasure-pain axis, would anything matter at all? And my answer would be no. Intuitively, yes, one can imagine all sorts of paradises, uh, you know, conjure up whatever you like, but without the pleasure pain axis to saturate them with a hedonic tone, completely meaningless. I would say nothing would inherently matter at all without the pleasure pain axis. Now, there's still a step one needs to make to say that nothing matters beyond pleasure and pain, but yeah, that is why. I would naturalize uh, a, a value along the lines of the pleasure pain axis. It's, uh... I mean, but intuitively, you wouldn't want to settle for being like a happy idiot if you could be a happy Einstein, mm. would you? Intuitively, no, but I mean, what is the whole point of intelligence? I.e., there is something unsatisfactory about one's existing state and one goes through a, a sequence of inferences, logical steps to get go to a better state, but wouldn't it be better to find out what the optimal state was and stay there? And this, yes, we do tend to value this process of, of inferential reasoning, but why not value the destination? <laughs> Is, is what matters the, the particular set of sequences or the, the states themselves. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's the states, I would say. You know, I suppose we don't yet know the nature of utilitronium. Is it something like orgasmium, orgasmic bliss? Is it something more uh, richly structured? Is it, is it a large mega mind in a state uh, of exquisite ecstasy or is it tiny micro uh, experiences um, this is this is this is still speculative um, but my point about intelligence only being of instrumental value is if you assume that the uh, the universe has only a finite number of states there is presumably this state this state space of optimal frames of mind states of mind uh, 
and once one has reached one of these optimal states of mind, there is simply no way to improve in it. What is the function of intelligence once one has reached one of these optimal states? Yes, yeah, sure, one can ring the changes within this state space, but there is nothing better beyond it. Well, has to be quite cautious when one says static, because although in one sense this is true, this individual optimal state can itself have tremendous internal richness, dynamism, perhaps it may involve anticipation, perhaps it may involve memory. Uh, this optimal state presumably will not itself involve any hint of stagnation, on the contrary, it may be uh, exhilarating. Yes, I mean, intuitively one imagines, well, what if one changed this or added this, wouldn't, wouldn't one access an even better state? But under the, ter under the terms of this uh, uh, conjecture, uh, no, one has reached the absolute maximum. Perhaps, uh, yes, the largest physically possible here and now, uh, optimised for, for, for pleasure, but it needn't be pure pleasure. Perhaps one can imagine uh, some sublimely beautiful landscape or something. I mean, it won't be a, a landscape, it might well be uh, some form of experiential modality completely alien to anything we could imagine. But what I, what I do find it difficult to conceive is that it won't involve the pleasure pain axis, or rather uh, one particular end of it. I mean, what, what is the future of the pleasure pain axis? Uh, I assume, and of course I could be wrong, that it gives us a clue to the future of life in the universe, but there are some conceptions of post-human superintelligence that uh, don't implicate consciousness at all, uh, the, uh, you know, the zombie scenarios.